Hello, welcome back to Happy Little Diodes. This is a good book. The plot is outstanding, you should read it. But that's not what we're talking about today. Today we're repairing a ZX Spectrum 48K. If you're familiar with the channel, you'll be very familiar with this machine as we've repaired millions of them. If you're new to the channel, stick around. It's a fantastic little 8-bit computer, which is really easy to work on. And today we've got a very interesting failure mode, which I'm gonna show you and I'm gonna fix. Okay, here's the patient. It's a Rubberkey 48K ZX Spectrum. If you watched the very first video which I ever posted on this channel, you might remember that that came from a manager at work. Well, so does this one. It seems like they're all hiding speckies in their loft somewhere. So let's see what we can do and win myself some brownie points in the office. I've seen a few of these machines which are assembled in Portugal. It tells me it's not going to be an extremely early issue board in there, maybe a three or a four. So let's open it up and see what we can find. There are five screws holding the specky case together and I'm not gonna make you sit through me unscrewing all five. Flipping it over and taking the top off carefully because there's a keyboard membrane in there with two ribbon cables which connect directly into the PCB. These old keyboard ribbons definitely can break very easily so you have to be super careful if you're not intending to replace it. Here's our PCB and it is an issue 4B. You can't really read it on there but that's what it says, issue 4B. Not a bad issue in my opinion. By the way, the goal here is to get this working so he can have a play with it. Later on we might decide to go on and finish with a full service. The ZX Spectrum can fail in a few ways, which means it would be bad to apply power straight away. We're going to do some tests without applying power first. So let's take a look down here at these eight chips. These are memory chips, and you might see there that there are three voltage supplies, a minus five, a plus five, and a plus 12 volt supply. These supplies come from the power circuit, which can fail in various ways, causing shorts. So what we're going to do is test the resistance of the three power supplies to these chips here to ground. And if any of them are close to zero, then we have a problem which needs addressing before putting power in. So here are pins minus five, plus five, plus 12 and ground. The actual resistances that you might measure vary. They vary depending on the board you're using and the range of your multimeter. They all come from this power circuit over here and there've been various versions of this throughout the years and the various issues of the ZX Spectrum. So let's see what we get. All I'm looking for is not zero. So the top left pin gave me mega ohms. Down here I'm getting kilo ohms and in the bottom right I'm getting kilo ohms. I'll also quickly measure ground which should be pretty much zero. That means I'm fairly happy to plug power into this thing as long as I use the current limiting bench supply. So let's get that set up next. The bench supply is set to 12 volts because I've been fixing a 4-track audio recorder. The owner blew up a large capacitor by putting in a reverse polarity plug. Did you see the capacitor on the bench at the start of the video? It properly blew up. Anyway, so I've set it to 9 volts, which is right for the specy, and I've limited the current to about 800 milliamps. I'm going to plug it in and see how much current it's drawing first of all. And it's about 500-600 milliamps. That's about normal. So I'm pretty happy that the power circuit is at least not catastrophically broken. We will of course check those voltages before we go any further. Minus 5 is reading minus 4.95, plus 12 is reading 12.1, and plus 5 is reading plus 5.01. That's all well within tolerance, which you can get from the ZX Spectrum service manual. Now I do want to have a look if it's generating any video output. Normally you would have to tune into the RF output of the specy, but if I hold the composite cable against the side of the RF modulator like this, I can just about pick up the composite signal that feeds it, and I can see that we have a white screen with a small white square in the bottom right. What we should be seeing is some text saying Sinclair Research or something like that. So we're ready to start debugging. But first I'm going to take this RF modulator out of the loop and bypass it so we can get a composite video picture directly out of the socket on the back of the machine. This is a normal mod which is done nowadays so that you can use the specy with a nicer picture on more modern TVs. I'll take the board out of the case first, it's held in by this one tiny little screw in the middle. While I've got the macro lens out, here's the serial number, if anybody's interested in that, you can go compare it with those on the Spectrum serial database. 
Also here's our ULA. The ULA is a bespoke chip which they don't make anymore, so fingers crossed this isn't broken. It's a Dash 7 ULA, which is a good sign. So anyway, on with this video mod. We'll take the top of the RF modulator case and we need to desolder this resistor from the output socket. So I'm just going to heat it with the iron and bend it out of the way with a screwdriver. Okay, that's that disconnected. There are these two wires going into the PCB. We need to disconnect both of these, so I'm going to desolder them from their joints and bend them up and out of the way. You might find instructions online saying to just cut the wires, but I don't like to do that. In the future, somebody might want to put this back to its original condition with the RF picture. So this allows for that. We're just going to bend these up and over the side of the case so they're trapped in by the lid when we put that back on after we finish the mod. Lovely. Okay, next, let's get a 100 microfarad 16 volt capacitor, which looks like this. I'm going to bend the positive leg up and over the body and pop it into the upper of the two holes which we just desoldered. That's going through there and the other leg is going to go into the RF modulator case through the side. Make sure you have this little plastic grommet in there so it doesn't short out because the case is connected to ground. There's no pretty way to do this bit. I'm not going to show you how I did it entirely because it's always messy. There, it's in. I'm going to bend this leg over the socket the tab on the socket. I'm not going to put it through the hole in the tab, definitely bending it over the top, bending it down so it's flush against it, and then soldering it in place. You might need to put a bit more heat than usual into this because you have that whole tab to heat up. And we have to solder the positive leg to the bottom side of the board on this joint. Popping the lid back on, we'll now be able to see what's happening with the video output of the Speccy while we're debugging it. Let's have another look at the failure mode. We have a white screen, we would call that white paper in the Speccy world, and a little white box in the bottom right. When I restart it, you can see that the screen fills up black and then goes white, and that tells me that the memory test is pretty much running all the way to the end but it's falling over at the end, which is a hint that the upper memory might be our problem, or maybe the CPU or the ROM could even be the problem. I'm fairly confident that we'll be able to run a diagnostic ROM. So this little device is called a Dandonator. It has a diagnostic ROM built in, and if the Z80 CPU and the ROM chip are in good working order, it should be able to execute this diagnostic program. So I'm plugging in my little spare keyboard that I keep handy for jobs like this. I'm going to plug it in and see what comes up on the screen. Just getting slightly sidetracked, I've been working on my own expansion diagnostic tool for the ZX Spectrum. It is an interface which will allow me to plug in a logic analyzer, the same one you saw in the previous video, the one designed by Dr. Gusman. I've had great fun getting to grips with KiCad and I'm looking forward to this arriving in the post so I can give it a go. With this, I'll be able to monitor what the Z80 is doing inside a Spectrum without even opening the case. The PCBs are arriving courtesy of PCBWay who are sponsoring this video. This is all brand new to me and every step of the way I find intimidating and confusing. Luckily PCBWay make it extremely easy to order your own PCB samples and what I really like is that they do a manual review on their end before they allow you to click go and spend your money. So what about the tool we're using today? Well it looks like it's booted, that's good news, and I'm able to run the diagnostic program. That means our Z80 is good, and it probably means our ROM chip is good, or at least not completely broken. Let's see what happens. It's passed the lower 16K memory test. What about the upper memory? The walk test passed. The inversion test fails. Okay, we've got a failure. Fantastic, that gives us somewhere to look. What about the upper RAM random test? Also fails, and it's telling me to check the following IC. So that's chip IC17, which is an upper RAM chip. I'm just going to run it again and make sure it gives me the same result. Sometimes the results tend to change depending on the failure mode. And it's failed the same test and it's telling me to look at the same chip. That's good. That's consistent. But in true happy little diode style, we're not just going to change it. We're going to dig deeper and see if we can see this failure mode in action and understand what's going on. So we're going to the memory browser, which is part of this diagnostic program. It's quite simple, really. Each memory address location stores a byte of data. So for example, in EF70, we have the value 6A. Now moving over to the right, FE must be in 
address EF71, and so on until we get to the new row where EF78 contains the value 43. What we can do in this memory browser, as well as view the contents of the memory, is edit the contents of the memory. So what I'm going to do is start to type some random numbers in and see what happens. I've deliberately chosen addresses in upper memory which should be affected by our failed chip. So there's my cursor moving across left to right, typing in 11 and 23, just random numbers. Now, have you spotted anything weird happening? Did you see it? Congratulations if you did. I'm going to play it again in slow motion. Watch again. Look at the row above the row I'm editing. We have DC there. It's changed to D8. Now I'm changing the next byte and the row above changed from 24 to 20. So in writing data to certain addresses in this memory, data in other addresses is changing. So we definitely have a failure mode. I've written down the three changes that we saw, DC to D8, 24 to 20 and 22 to 26. I'm going to write all of these out in binary and I'm not reading out all those ones and zeros. Just take my word for it that they're right. If you spotted what's happening based on the hex values, well done, you're a lot smarter than me. If you spotted it now based on the binary values, well done, you're a lot smarter than me. I'm going to line them all up underneath each other and make it really obvious for myself. Yet yeah, now I can see that the same bit has flipped in all three cases. This seems to be the sixth bit in from the left or the third bit in from the right, which if we number it as our data bus is numbered, corresponds to bit two of the data bus. Now, am I finished dragging this out? No, I'm not. I want to have a look at the ZX Spectrum motherboard. These are the eight upper RAM chips. You'll notice there are eight. You'll notice there are eight bits in an eight bit computer's data bus. So each chip here contributes one bit of data to the data bus. Going back to the schematic and zooming in to the bottom right, these are our eight upper memory chips. Now let's zoom into the ROM here just so we can see which line corresponds to which bit of the data bus. I'm going to highlight the second bit of the data bus, also known as D2, and see where it goes. Yep, it goes to IC17, which is the very same chip that the diagnostic ROM told us to go to. Fantastic. We better stop procrastinating and get on with the actual work. I'm using the powered solder sucker to get this chip out and I had an absolute nightmare with it because I blocked the gun, spent ages trying to unblock it, got a new gun out and then that gun wasn't doing very well maybe because it's a brand new nozzle, I'm not sure. I had to get the John Wick out just to tidy up before finally removing the chip after a little bit of encouragement by waggling pins around with the soldering iron. Thankfully patience prevailed and the chip came out without leaving any damage behind. There it goes, and I gave it a quick visual inspection to make sure that none of the tracks had been lifted or damaged in any way before popping a new socket in. We're going to solder that into place, stick a new RAM chip in, and we should be hopefully away with a working specy. Drum roll please, here we go. Upper RAM walk test, pass. Inversion test should pass. And the next test is the one that was failing, the march test, and it's passed. And the random test has also passed. Good, we've fixed it. Okay, I did run the soak test for a while just to make sure. Now I'm gonna have a look at this keyboard ribbon and see if these old keyboard ribbon cables have survived. So I've plugged them in and I'm pressing every key on the keyboard and just to prove it, they all work. Amazing. I have to be careful with it still because they are brittle and in the future if we decide to service this machine we'll put a new one in. So let's just put it back together. Here's a top tip, always replace the anti-tamper sticker so it looks like you haven't been inside the machine. I should probably have used one of my own anti-tamper stickers but anyway I'm just doing this as a favour and Ross if you're watching don't take your computer to bits. If it stops working give it me back. If you'll excuse me I'm going to play a bit of Treasure Island Dizzy. By the way, while we're on specy topics, I'm heading down to Crash Live this year. I managed to blag myself a late ticket. So if you're going to be there, keep an eye out, say hello. Thanks for watching and please like, subscribe, share and all that stuff.